Hello. So yes, we came to talk about uh, some networking stuff because we didn't have enough of them yet, right? Um, I'm going to present uh, some uh, overview about the network binding plugin and Leonardo will take off with, uh, with the demonstration. It should be a light, a light talk. So if you have any questions, uh, you can interrupt me. And, but I need help with the Q and A if, if someone can translate it from the messages. Um, second. Can you see me the screen, right? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes, sir. I can see. Okay. So we'll try. We'll start with a small introduction about myself. My name is Edward Haas. Usually people call me Eddie. I'm a contributor and maintainer in the SIG network of the COVID COVID project. Uh, you can contact me in the details here. I'm working for Red Hat for uh, nine years or more. Uh, I, I came from a previous project that was called Overt. It still exists, but uh, uh, Covert more or less replaces it and continues on. So the Initially, I wanted to ex explain what is the binding plugin. Uh, sorry, what is the network binding? Because it's not something that everyone understands exactly. So, at its base, this is how uh, a VM looks like. It's it lives in a in a node that li and lives in a pod, and then we have this uh, virtual machine. A very innovative idea, and. Um, the way I don't have a laser here to show you, but uh, usually the connectivity comes already from the node. It depends, uh, actually it depends, but more or less, if you have an, an interface in the node, it will go to some host networking, uh, cloud or implementation. And from there, it will go to the pod. Usually in the pod, you will see an interface with it. it for example, here it's ETH zero. But if you have multiple uh, interfaces, then you will have to, you will see more of them. Um, and the network inside the pod, the, the part that you, we see here, the pod, what we write here, pod network, is the part that we call a network binding. And the reason is, is because this is the way we allow the virtual machine in that pod to connect to the outside, which means to go out through this ETH zero thing. There are two parts here that uh, allow this in like in what we have today. And if we are, if I'm not looking at the bind at the plugin stuff at all, is the CNI which which creates the connectivity between the node and the pod. And uh, there is the domain attachment part, which is um, what we configure on the livered domain configuration so it will connect the vm to the to whatever it, there is in the pod network like uh, for example a tab device that's the classic case um so which binding pl plugins we had until uh, no sorry which binding networks we had until now uh, we have we had the classic ones which is the bridge binding the masquerade binding the srov binding and the sleeve one uh, they were here more or less from the beginning of the project or very soon after it started. Um, and then we had additions, for example, this make VTAP and, and past bindings. Um, and it started to be a little bit uh, overloaded, uh, specifically the Mac VTAP and past, if we want to see the difference, I mean, what is a bit different between them is that the Mac VTAP and the past were introduced as experiment to the uh, to the project. So and we wanted to see how it works. So they were protected using feature gates. Hope everyone knows what that means. Um, and there was something special about Slurp, 
which uh, which is a user space uh, networking implementation. The, what was special about it is that it uh, was there from the beginning, but we saw that most of the users never used it because it's very, very slow and uh, introduces some performance issues. So we expected, I mean, we saw that most of the users are using the bridge and masquerade. So what we, I, this is like, that's a hint to what happened later when we talked about the plugins, but what we wanted and what actually happened today is that the MacVita, the past and the slave binding are gone, at least for 1.3, the next version, it, none of them are there anymore. Uh, they pass some uh, deprecation process, but they, they are still available if someone wants the functionality, they are available through the plugins. So what are, what were the challenges that we had, uh, that all of this came from? So we saw a lot of community requests to extend and tweak the existing bindings, add a small feature there, some ability there. And we also saw that many are looking to have special bindings that are, we don't have, so they wanted more binding. The problem that we, we had with that is that while we wanted to answer all of these uh, great ideas, we had the problem of maintaining that. Uh, the, the team, the SIG network team is not that big and uh, having a lot of options and a lot of bindings means that the code base is, will increase and we will have to support all of these options and all of the permutation of it. And, and we saw that as a, as a problem. So that's the maintenance one. And uh, the other part that we, we had a problem with, or, or not a problem, that is what we wanted to preserve is the ability to have uh, an open community that can contribute and can innovate new things. So we wanted to allow people and answer them and give them a, an option to do what they needed. And, and by that, I'm not I'm not referring to cloning the project and then patching it because that is also hard for the downstream uh, project that tries to do that, but to allow them to innovate and maybe even share their innovation with others. So for that, we, we came up with this network binding plugin, which basically says this. It says that if we had before what this, the previous, uh, diagram that I had before, we are just going to add just a few options. So people will be able to add their functionality or their tweaks by themselves without the need to modify the code base of the core project. So in general, we have, we have uh, that the plugin itself contains, can contain several components or can contain only one. It depends what you need. Uh, we have the plugin CNI, which is it is needed if you need to actually configure the network of the pod. So, for example, for SROV or for VDPA, most likely you don't need it because you don't going you are not going to change the stack of the network inside the pod. So, usually that one is not needed, but at least for SROV, I'm sure about it. And the plugin sidecar uh, is. Is, uh, is just another container that runs together with the container, the, this virt launcher container, which is basically the, the heart of the, of the VM, that, the thing that manages it as an entity. So we have another container there. That, that, that one has two things that it can do. I will describe it later. It basically allows you to change the domain XML, which is the the configuration of the VM. So you can inter, inter, intercept it and change it. And it allows you maybe to run other things there like a service or, or some kind of uh, another application in that container. And we also added something that is called a domain attachment, which is something that is, if you don't want to write anything and your what you wanted to add is very simple, you could use that. I'll talk about it later. Um, let's see how much time I have. 
not a lot. Um, okay, so how I, this is a quick uh, explanation of what is the flow of creating a VM and how all of this going into it, so you'll understand the big picture. So if a user creates a VM CR, that will trigger the VM controller to create a VM ICR. Nothing in here about it uh, here. Then the VMI controller will will actually see the VMI CR and then will trigger a creation of the pod. And here is something that happens in the in a regular in a core binding. Well, the core binding are the bindings that are supported inside the code base of covert uh, core. And the uh, plugins are the ones that someone can add from ex from outside. So if it was a regular binding, a core binding, then the viewer will have uh, seen this pod being created and it will start configuring the network inside the pod. But if we have the, the binding plugin, then the, the CNI plugin will configure the network instead of the virt handler. And it will it will prepare everything so the so the network will be there ready for the next phase. Just uh, uh, to be clear, the the net changing the network inside the pod requires a root uh, or a privileged um, operation. So it cannot be done by uh, someone like the virt launcher, which has no which is rootless in most cases. Uh, this is why we need it. We had it done with the virt handler, and now it's by the CNI plugin. Then the Vitender can continue working it because it may do other things. Um, and in the also in the core binding, the Virt launcher would have uh, started some service, for example, uh, DHCP server inside the pod and cr created the domain directly. But with the plugin, we do these two things together. So the sidecar plugin will intercept the creation of the domain. It can change the configuration and can start a service if you want to. Um, the configuration part. This I'll go very quickly about it. Uh, so the if you want to configure a plugin, you just need to register it. So you need to add it to the Kubert uh, CR. This is the location where under the binding, you need to give it the name and then you can put the configuration parts. This one uses the domain attachment. Um, then you will need, uh, wait one second, yes. then you'll need the VM, in the VM itself you need under the interfaces, you, you, you need to specify under binding the name of that plugin, so it will point to it, and that's it. So so again, the covert, the covert uh, this, this configuration is done by administrator, and this one is done by the one that creates the VM. Now details, uh, we have a lot of details in the documentation, so you can look here, this is one link, but uh, you, you have also user guides and development guides, and you also have the de design itself. So I think uh, if you want to implement this, and we saw this an example yesterday, that, some, that um, partners and users are, are doing that already, so you can try it out, but I'll give you a very, very quick uh, overview of it. So the network attachment definition is if you need a CNI to be run, you need to point to a, to a network attachment definition and that one will trigger a CNI execution. That's the part that if you want to change the pod network, uh, this is how an example, how uh, such a thing may look like. Uh, Note, this is not a connectivity to the node, this is the connectivity that is inside the, the pod itself. Then we have the, if you want a sidecar, a sidecar, this means that you want to actually modify the, the domain configuration or run a service. So you should put here a link to, a, to an image that can run the sidecar, that the sidecar will run. With. And then we have download API. This is something that yesterday was, uh, and we will show it now uh, also. Download API is to pass information from the pod uh, down to the application, so it can be used by the uh, by the application to do the the changes. In this case, we need information from the pod from what Multus is telling us to do the the changes in the in the domain configuration. 
And the migration is an option if, if this is not set by anything. In this case, the method is link refresh, which means that it starts and stops the link, uh, raises the link and sets it down, or the opposite. Uh, this allows the, the migration to happen, and it's most relevantly for the primary network if you use it. Otherwise, it will not do anything. Uh, in the future, um, we have several ideas how to what to do but uh, we need more feedback from the community so if you guys have any needs or you want uh, you have uh, an idea then it will be great to get to get them as feedback some of the ideas are for example that we want to add now there is a pr open to add a container uh, resource to control the container resources this is the con the compute container because there are some bindings that require more resources from the compute node. The, uh, an exam uh, the example is passed for it. And uh, there is also, there may be requirement, there is today a, re a requirement to, uh, to limit and to control the resources of the sidecar itself, something that does not exist today. Um, there are others, uh, but I don't, I don't think I have a lot of time to tell you, but if we we'll, if the demo will go really quickly and Leonardo will, will be done quickly, we can go back to this. Um, that's it, uh, Leonardo. I hope you can. Thank you, Eddie. Can I share my screen? Uh, yes. I don't know if you have to stop yours. Oh, yeah. I did. Okay, you should be seeing it. So following up uh, your plugin uh, framework presentation, uh, we have a real case scenario using this paradigm that is the DPA integration in revert as a binding plugin. So, okay, a few uh, quick introduction of myself. Uh, I am Leonardo Milleri and I uh, work for Red Hat, uh, the virtual your networking team. And in the last two years, I've been working to integrate VDPA in Kubernetes and OpenShift. Uh, quick introduction of VDPA uh, stands for Virtual Data Path Acceleration. The basic idea is to take uh, the Virtual Net interface and push it directly to the physical NIC. Uh, it is composed of uh, two parts, uh, a standard uh, data plane, uh, the ring layout following the virtual specification and uh, a vendor specific control plane that is translated uh, by the VDP framework uh, into a generic control plane. Uh, so why uh, there is this growing interest in VDPA, which, which are the advantages? First of all, it accelerates high performance containers, VMs at layer two, layer three, without vendor specific um, uh, dependency. Uh, accelerating means uh, to steer packets as fast as we can from the container of VM to the physical NIC. Uh, one of those examples is uh, uh, SIV, uh, that uh, though uh, it has some dependency on the NIC vendor driver, that is why VDPA comes into play, uh, letting VM and containers images to be decoupled from the vendor physical NIC. So this simplifying the certification and uh, testing efforts. Uh, so I'm gonna present a quick demo, uh, quick, uh, so a few notes about the environment, uh, the hardware, we have um, a bare metal machine with an NVIDIA Connect X6 DX card. In the software stack uh, for keeping things uh, simple, uh, I have deployed a Kubernetes kind uh, cluster with two nodes as Docker containers. And um, Kubevert uh, is deployed. Uh, uh, we also, we have this extension to the Kubevert CI that is the VDPA provider that helps out uh, partitioning the physical function into virtual functions, create the VHOS and DP devices, and also deploy all the SIOV components that that are like operator, CNI, uh, plugin, that are mm, useful for discovering and advertising uh, devices to Kubernetes, allocating devices to pods, etc. And uh, finally, the VDPA sidecar plugin, 
that um, is um, is doing the, the VDPA binding that is able to inject the VDPA secondary interface into the VM. Okay, uh, let's have a look to the demo. It's a recorded one. Uh, okay, um, so uh, okay, we, we have uh, two, two nodes here, uh, control plane and worker node. And if we check the, the physical um, physical function here, we have uh, two VFs, VF0 and VF1. And um, using the VDPA tool, we are also able to see the VDPA devices. As you can see, each one of the devices map into a PCI address. And uh, those two are the char device for, um, for the VDPA, the host VDPA. Okay, this is the device info information. Uh, that is um, this one device information for every device we created. And it brings some useful information like uh, the uh, which is a driver, in this case the host, and uh, which is the, the path to the VDP device, the PCI address. And this inf information is um, sent to the VDPA sidecar plugin in order to, to be able to am amend the uh, libvirt XML domain and to, to add the, the required interface. Okay, this is something we already shown how to customize the kubevert uh, uh, custom resource. We specify the binding with the DPA and uh, we enable the device info. Uh, this is the network touch definition we have used. We create a VTP network. We have the SRV SNI. This is the uh, virtual machine manifest. As you can see, there are two interfaces, the default one and the, the NIC uh, that is binding the VTPA device. And of course, we have the, the networks on the top, the default network and the the one binding the VDPA network. We created two VMs, VM1 and VM2. And um, we wait for the VM to, to be up and running. Okay. Okay, this script uh, is for checking for checking the the pod annotation, the vert launcher. We here we have the VDPA network, the device info is part of the annotation as well, and the XML domain for the VM has this new interface type VDPA with the MAC address, uh, the because VDPA zero device, and it is a virtual interface. Okay, finally we are. We connect to the first VM, we check the secondary interface, Ethernet 1, and we can see the, it is, uh, the driver is virtual net, so a standard virtual net interface. We pick the IP address and we ping now from, from the other machine in order to check the network connectivity. So yeah, it's working, working as expected. Thank you for watching this demo and and uh, yeah, I would like to thank you, Alona Paz, or Mergi and Edward for for supporting me in this integration work. And uh, I guess we, we can we have a couple of minutes maybe for query and answers.
That was great. Thanks, guys. We have one question that I can see, which is any non-telecom use cases where this can help. Um, yes, uh, in general, we saw we saw in in the community there were several PRs that requested to change things that are I don't think they are telecom related um, for even the existing bindings like the bridge binding. There was I remember there was a request to do mirroring support. All, all of these cases could be to to create a new binding and do all of these tweaks there. So I don't think it's it's only for telecom. But I, if that was the meaning of the question. Yes, that seems to clarify. I don't see any other questions, in which case we might wrap up this session and get on to the next one. 